So our next talk prior to um, our panel discussion is by Alan Mita, who uh, uh, came to us from the University of Texas. Alan's been here now three years? Three years uh, with his wife, who co-lead our experimental therapeutics program, and will talk to us about phase one trials in kidney cancer. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here, and uh, giving a talk to uh, cancer survivor is always very special and very dear to my heart. So we're gonna talk about how to develop better cancer therapies, introduction to phase one clinical trials, and personalized medicine. So I'm gonna start with some numbers, some uh, mind-boggling numbers. Um, there are almost one and a half million new cases of cancer in the United States every year, and more than half a million cancer-related deaths. The lifetime probability of developing cancer is one in two in men and one in three in women. And it's estimated that about a quarter of our current population will die of cancer. Cancer is now the number one killer of Americans under 85. On the bright side, there are also 10 million cancer survivors in the United States, such as you. And that is related mainly to early detection and better treatments. So why do we need clinical trials? We need clinical trials because obviously we don't cure all cancers yet, and we need more efficient therapies. We also need less toxic therapies that will improve our quality of life for the patients treated with, for cancer. And we also need to better match the patients with the optimal treatment, which is called personalized medicine. Just remember that clinical trials is the only way to rationally develop new drugs and to bring new drugs to the patients to the market. So how do you bring a new drug to the market, to the patients? It's a stepwise and long process. It takes about 10 to 20 years from research to bring a drug to the market. And it's also very expensive, one to two billion dollars to bring just one drug. It starts here, <coughs> oops, sorry. It starts here in the lab when you discover a new promising agent, and then you have to do long testing in the lab in cell lines and animals. And if this drug looks promising, then you go to the FDA and you have an investigational new drug application which allows you to start testing the drug in humans. And if you talk about drug discovery, you have here the drug discovery funnel that shows that it takes to test about 20,000 compounds to only bring one drug to the market. So it's very discouraging and you have to go through this funnel in order to develop a cancer therapy. Then once you identify this drug and you have the approval from the FDA to test it in patients, it goes to the clinical testing. And the clinical testing is also stepwise. It goes to several phases. The phase one clinical trials, which ask the question, is this drug safe? Is it appropriate to use in humans? The phase two trials ask the question, does this drug work? Is it good for a certain type of cancer? And the phase three trials ask the question, is this drug better than our standard of care, the treatment that we already have? And then, if all these questions have been answered and it's a great drug, then you have the registration approval, but you're still not done. You still have to conduct the phase four studies, which are the post-marketing trials. We try to see that, is there anything that we have missed while we treated this you know, few hundreds of patients on these clinical trials? Is there any signal that we, we have missed? So remember the drug discovery funnel? After the drug discovery funnel comes the drug development funnel. So when you enter the clinical trials, not all the drugs make it to the market. And it's estimated that actually one in 16 drugs that enter clinical trials, it's approved. So it's a very, very high attrition uh, rates in the clinical testing, and we have to do a much better job here. So let's start with the phase one clinical trials. What are the phase one clinical trials? So these are the first in human trials, a critical step in developing any drug. And because they are so sensitive and so critical, are only done in a few centers, one to three centers, uh, with a slow and very cautious accrual. They typically accrue 15 to 50 patients, and they integrate extensive research studies. The main question that these trials are trying to answer is, is this drug safe and appropriate for human use? Um, the patient population that is enrolled in phase one clinical trials has to have a confirmed diagnosis of refractory cancer for which no effective therapy exists. They are awfully heavily pretreated because they have to have exhausted all the available treatments, and typically they enroll various tumor types. In a phase one clinical trial, you generally enroll all type of cancers. But more recently, there are phase one clinical trials that are disease oriented in a certain tumor type based on a specific target. For example, 
Ed Posadas talked about this HIF2 alpha, which is a target that is mainly expressed in kidney cancer, and therefore it makes sense to try a phase one study only for patients with kidney cancer in this indication. And these patients have also to have normal liver, kidney, and bone marrow function. And this is a conundrum because this is a patient that have a long history of cancer, a long history of treatments, and they still have to be in great shape, have normal liver, kidney, bone marrow function, and that's why a lot of patients, unfortunately, do not qualify for these trials. The goals of phase one cancer trials are to determine the maximum tolerated dose and the recommended dose for further clinical testing, which is the dose that is safe and with a high probability of being also active. And they also try to define the drug safety, the toxicity profile, the side effects, and how to deal with them. The subsecondary goal, which is how the treatment affects the human body. It's called the pharmacology of the drug. And these are two words here, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. The pharmacokinetics means the analysis of the drug absorption, distribution, and metabolism. In other words, what the body does to the drug. And then the other aspect of this is the pharmacodynamic. That means what the drug does to the body, the relationship between the drug dose, behavior, and the clinical effects. One of the secondary goals of the phase one clinical trials is to document any efficacy that might occur. Because safety is clearly very important, but as cancer doctors, we want to see whether this drug helps our patients. Is there any signal that this drug is helpful? And very interestingly, all the approved drugs that we have today for cancer have demonstrated at least one response in a phase one clinical trial. And these responses also help orient the next steps, the phase two trials, because if you see a response, let's say, in a patient with kidney cancer, obviously we're gonna go and do an exploration in more patients with kidney cancer to see how robust that effect is. Very briefly about phase two clinical trials, these are the first time in a certain disease, kidney cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and the question they are trying to answer is the drug efficacy in a certain tumor type. Does it work in kidney cancer? Does it work in lung cancer? As a difference to the phase one studies, there's a multi-center and rapidly enrolling clinical trials that are usually completed within very few months, and they typically enroll about 50 to 100 patients. The patient population for these trials also has to have a confirmed diagnosis of a cancer, but with a limited number of prior therapies, most often second or third line of therapy. And they also have to have relatively normal liver, kidney, and bone marrow function tests. And most importantly, they have to have measurable disease. And why do they have to have measurable disease? Is because we are trying to see what's the tumor response. We assess the tumor response to this treatment, how the treatment impacts on the tumor volume. And we can achieve what we call a complete remission, a complete response, which is the disappearance of all tumors, which is the ideal situation, and we all celebrate when this happens. We can achieve a partial response, which is a good reduction in the tumor size, but at least 30%. Unfortunately, a lot of patients have progressive disease, which is a 20% increase of the tumor burden, and everything in between is considered to be stable disease, neither increase nor decrease. Most importantly, we are trying to determine the duration of response because what we want to see is a robust control of the cancer, and I always teach my students, if I have to choose between a partial remission that lasts two months and a stable disease that lasts two years, I'll always take the stable disease. So the duration of response is just as important as a tumor shrinkage. And finally, of course, overall survival, because that's what we ultimately want to see. We want to see our patients living longer. Just one slide about phase three clinical trials. These are large randomized trials which compare the treatment under study with the best available therapy. And the question that's asked is, is this better than what we've already have? So the patients are generally assigned by chance to one of the treatments, and this is something that they never like, but unfortunately that's the only way that we've been able to develop these drugs. And these are large and expensive studies. Sometimes they enroll more than 1,000 patients for uh, these trials. And surprisingly, a lot of drugs fail at this stage. About one in two drugs that arrives at this stage after all the research that has been put into fails at this stage. So the major endpoint that the FDA wants to see with this phase this trial is survival. They want to see that these drugs can make our patients live longer. And finally, as I said, even when you approve a drug, you are still not done with the research. We are doing these phase four studies after drug approval and marketing trying to see if we miss something, because we have treated a few hundreds or a few thousands of patients, but sometimes there are side effects that happen in only 1% of the patients or less, and we still have to try to identify these problems and to deal with them. And this is what we're doing at, uh, here at Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute. Clinical trials are a priority, because this is the way to offer cutting-edge treatments to our patients. 
And we are offering phase one studies for patients who have received every reasonable standard of care. We offered phase two studies for patients with certain tumor types where we know that progress is needed. And we offered phase three studies for the most promising drugs, which could become the new treatments for tomorrow. We also do translational studies. And translational studies means that we are going back from the patient to the laboratory to better understand the side effects and the mechanism of action of these drugs and how to improve in the way we use them. Now, going back to renal cancer. In 2005, the state-of-the-art uh, treatment for advanced renal cancer included two drugs, only two drugs available in 2005, interleukin-2 and interferon-alpha. And there was clearly a huge need for developing new and more efficacious treatments. And then the targeted therapy revolution happened in renal cell cancer. And it all started with some phase one studies. These phase one studies with these drugs with barbarian names, Bay439006, SU11248, CCI779, they all have a common thread. All these phase one studies showed some responses in patients with renal cell carcinoma, as you can see here. And this is something that was not seen before. Renal cell carcinoma was notoriously refractory to all the treatments that we had. And these drugs became thereafter sorafenib, sunitinib, temsirolimus, drugs that we've all heard about and we, some of you have received already, that had marked this targeted therapy revolution in renal cell carcinoma. This is a slide that I borrowed from Dr. Figlin, uh, and this shows the timeline of the approval of these drugs and the timeline of this targeted therapy revolution in renal cancer. And as you can see here from 82, when the first responses with interleukin interferon were seen, until 2004, not much happened. Only one drug approved, interleukin high dose, but a lot of research, a lot of research that allow us to understand how kidney cancer works. And this research that was done here led to this revolution. In just a few years, from 2005 to 2010, all these drugs that got approved, uh, temsirolimus, everolimus, pazopanib, sorafenib, sunitinib, etc., and we have now a rich armamentarium for the treatment of the kidney cancer, cancer patients, and yes, they do much better and they live much longer than they used uh, 10 to 15 years ago. Now, remember, all this started with phase one studies. And in continuing this tradition, we have here phase one studies for renal cell carcinoma. And these are the four studies that I'm going to briefly talk about. The phase one, two trial of TRC-105 and axitinib. The PI is Dr. Ed Posadas. The phase one trial of PT-2385, PI being Dr. Figlin. The phase one study of MLN-0128 and SGN-CD70A, PI Dr. Monica Mita. The first one is the phase one, two trial of TRC-105 and axitinib. Axitinib is a drug that you may have heard about. It's approved for the treatment of renal cancer. It's an oral inhibitor of some receptor tyrosine kinases, such as VGFR1, 2, and 3. These are implicated in angiogenesis, as Dr. Posada explained, the formation of new blood vessels that are critical for the tumor growth. And because of that, they trigger tumor growth and cancer progression. Now, TRC-105 is an antibody targeting CD-105, which is also an important antigenic target, which is very distinct from VGFR, however. And TRC-105 also inhibits angiogenesis, tumor growth, and metastasis in animal models, and it nicely complements the activity of drugs that target VGFR. In a phase one study, the drug was well tolerated and caused a reduction of angiogenic biomarkers and tumor burden. By targeting a non-VGF pathway, this drug has the potential to complement the VGF inhibitors and could represent a major advance in the cancer therapy. The combination of this drug, TRC-105 and axitinib, is now currently under evaluation here at Cedar sinai The phase one part of the study has been accomplished and it showed that the drugs can be safely combined together. And now the phase two part of the study is ongoing, trying to see how much more active the combination is compared to axitinib alone, so stay tuned. The next study is PT2305, which is a HIF2 alpha inhibitor. So now we know, uh, after all that research I talked about for renal cancer, that 90% of renal cancers have an abnormal gene called VHL. And this tumor suppressor gene being abnormal leads to accumulation of HIF2 alpha. This HIF2 
2 alpha and HIF1 alpha or hypoxia inducible factors are transcription factors that interfere with the DNA and are implicated in cancer growth and resistance to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The drug PT2385 is a first in class and highly selective inhibitor of HIF2 alpha and it's orally administered. It has demonstrated robust tumor regression and growth inhibition in animals and it was safe and well tolerated in animals. And now this first in human study with a drug was recently initiated at Cedar sinai and the first two patients were already approached and will be enrolled in the next week or so. A, just a few words about a couple of other studies. This study with MLN0128, uh, this is a novel mTOR MPI3 kinase inhibitor if you want a super everolimus. Uh, the study in renal cancer uh, has been accomplished and is close to accrual, and the final results are now awaited. And this other trial with SGNCD70A in patients with CD-positive malignancy, CD70 was also identified to be an important marker for renal cancer, and the study is now undergoing regulatory approval. We have to see it open in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for this one as well. The last part of my talk is going to be about personalized medicine and how to better match each patient and its optimal treatment. You've heard this morning that renal cancer is not one disease. There are many, many different types of renal cancer and they are all very different from a histologic microscopic standpoint. But the biomarkers have advanced with technology. And we evolved from the first hematoxylin eosine stain, which allowed us to identify cancer cells within a normal tissue, to immunohistochemistry, which allows us to identify this different type of renal cancers. And now we are in the era of gene arrays. And the gene arrays are, if you want, the molecular fingerprinting or the genetical fingerprinting of a tumor. And these gene arrays have been the nightmare of my fellowship. I thought that I'm never going to be able to understand. This is way too complicated, way above my head, when actually things are pretty simple. On a gene array, you have columns, and each column is a patient sample or a tumor, and you have rows, and each row is a gene. And you have two color codes, green, which means downregulated, and red, which means overexpression. So on this gene array, you can see that for these patients here, these genes are downregulated, while these genes here are overactive, which is very different in these patients here who have a very different genetic profile. And why is that important? It is important because molecular biology can allow us to diagnose and treat cancer more effectively. And I'm going to give you an example in lung cancer, but this applies for any type of cancer, including renal cancer. This is a study that was done in a few hundreds of patients with one type of lung cancer. All these patients had identical lung cancer from a microscopic standpoint. However, when you do a gene array, you can see that there are at least three different types of cancers. These patients here have a downregulation of this group of genes here and upregulation of this group of genes here. This group of patients here have an upregulation of these genes here, and the third group of patients have none of them. And why is that important? These are some survival curves that show you how many patients are alive at 30, 40, 50, 60 months. In this group of patients, Almost all patients are alive at five years, which is very different with this group of patients where only half of the patients are alive at five years, and very different with this group of patients where almost all patients are dead after just a couple of years. So clearly, these are three distinct types of lung cancer, although they look identical under the microscope, and this genetic profiling can separate these three groups and clearly, we have to develop new therapies, much better therapies for these two group of patients in order to achieve the same results as we have the, the good group. So this is the promise of tailoring multi-targeting therapies through personalized medicine. So we hope that we're going to achieve that when you have a group of four patients who have exactly the same type of cancer, based on their genetic profiling, you will be able to tailor the treatment and patient A will receive surgery and a targeted therapy. Patient B will receive radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and another targeted therapy. While patient C may only need a targeted therapy, etc., etc. And also to choose which one of these targeted therapy is the most appropriate for each patient. So this is a very famous painting by Rembrandt from the 1600s, the anatomy lecture of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. 
And maybe Dr. Talp is showing his students a type of cancer based on the anatomic profile, where the cancer started. And this is what we have been doing for 500 years. But now we are moving in the genomic era. And it's more important not where the cancer started, but what the genetic profile of that cancer is. Because what we have been doing for many, many years, when we had a group of patients and we have several treatment options, patients were recommended a certain treatment based on very uh, rudimentary, very primitive things such as the tumor size, the number of lymph nodes, and how it looked under the microscope. And they were assigned to either surgery or radiation or active surveillance without knowing anything about their genetic profile. What we hope to be able to do from now on, based on this sophisticated genetic approach that we have available here at Cedars, is to match each patient with the best treatment. And based on that molecular profile, to tailor for each patient the most appropriate therapeutic approach, whether it's surgery, radiation, targeted therapy, or maybe just active surveillance. And we hope that this is going to be a much better way of treating cancer and to evolve towards personalized medicine. My last slide, the conclusion about clinical trials. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is a federation of the best cancer centers in the United States, has the motto that the best care of a cancer patient is within a clinical trial. Unfortunately, only 5% of the cancer patients in this country are enrolled in clinical trials. Keep in mind that without clinical trials, we'll continue to practice yesterday medicine instead of the medicine of the future, and that the first cure of patients with advanced cancer were seen in phase one clinical trials. And therefore, every clinical trial is a new hope for cancer patients, or if you want, a new dawn, such as this favorite painting of mine from Monet. And with this, um, I am done, and thank you for your attention.